move next to uh, uh, Rianne Harvey. And uh, Rianne is working with uh, Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society. And uh, the title of Rianne's talk is Remotely Piloted Aircraft Systems, a Tool to Support Coastal Climate Change Adaptation in Nova Scotia. So Rianne, welcome and uh, over to you. Yeah, thanks Leif. And um, I'll just share my screen. And can you all see my screen? Yes. Yep. Great. Yeah, I just wanted to say thanks, Barry, for that presentation. It was really, really cool to see your work. Those, those maps are really amazing. And it's great to see these sort of visualizations um, actually being applied and, and used in practice. So yeah, my name is Rianne, um, and I work as a conservation campaigner with the Nova Scotia chapter of the Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society. And we work in Mi'kmaq, which is the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. So I'm actually going to talk today about my graduate project research, um, which I did as part of the Masters of Marine Management at Dalhousie, and this was supported by Oceans North. And I was looking at remotely piloted aircraft systems, otherwise known as drones, um, to see how they can support coastal climate change adaptation in Nova Scotia. So drone technology is constantly improving. And over the last decade, we've seen an increase in the uh, commercial and recreational uses. They're becoming more widely available and they're cheaper and easier to operate than helicopters and other forms of hyperspatial data collection. So for marine and coastal management, um, there's a variety of uses and, and these include wildlife monitoring, shallow water ecosystem mapping, um, identifying coastal hazards and even counting plastic debris. But for this research, I focused on the ability of the maps to create accurate coastal, the ability of drones to create accurate coastal maps. In Nova Scotia, sea level rise is predicted and is occurring uh, higher than the global average due to the coastal subsidence and the low-lying topography. Um, and we're also seeing increased intensity and frequency of storms. And, the, and these are just some of the impacts of climate change that we've covered lots of others today in the other talks. Um, but it really sort of like brings to light the need for cost-effective um, adaptation strategies that we can use throughout the coastline and, and that these are available to all different stakeholders, not stakeholders, not just government and researchers. So I wanted to look to see how the 3D maps created by drones can assist with coastal climate change adaptation. So I looked at um, the visualizations they provide how people engage with these visualizations and the potential applications. I used two sites in Queens County. So there was the Port Mattoon Central Breakwater and then uh, one of the sandy beaches in Thomas Riddell Provincial Park. And both of these sites were picked based on like the variety of, sort of like landscapes they, um, they represent, but also based on um, based on um, like some feedback from community members. So in July 2019, I went down with the Marine Affairs Biz Lab. We flew the drone, we collected imagery, and then we processed these images using the Agisoft Metashape software to create digital surface models. Um, and then with these maps, I, did, I undertook some semi-structured interviews with a variety of different stakeholders. Um, and use these maps in comparison to Google Maps imagery and like asked a series of questions. So I just wanted to show you quickly like some stills from the maps. So they can, we use them to create 2D and 3D maps. And these are sort of screenshots from the 2D maps. You can see the beach and the wharf. And then this is a screenshot from one of the 3D maps. Um, and similar to Barry's maps, you can zoom in um, and you can pan around. Um, yeah, and it, so this is this is sort of a selection. This is the breakwater on part of the wharf. So, what's the advantages of using drone maps over Google Maps imagery? Well, they convey a lot more information, and this table lists just some of the physical characteristics that the interview participants noted. So, this includes topography, um, like the height of the wharf the vegetation type, the sediment type, and you can even see the, um, 
the like the high tide markings in, in this image as well. You can see that along the edge of the rocks there. And these maps can provide, using the correct methodology, can provide up to a centimeter of accuracy. And actually, the majority of the participants um, commented on how they felt more connected to this to these sites after viewing the maps and how this, like, these maps provided an enhanced sense of place. Um, and together with these physical characteristics, that creates a more holistic perspective um, of the environment. And with this, it's easier to sort of, um, it's either to see the impacts of climate change and all of the participants commented on how these maps either increased or clarified to them the impacts of climate change that these sites um, will be facing. So given the accuracy, the physical characteristics, um, and the realistic visualizations that these maps provide, what are the potential applications? Um, so this list is by far, for, it's far from comprehensive. Um, these were some of the sort of applications that were brought up um, by the participants and through a literature review. Um, but it was pretty interesting to see how many of these are applicable to other groups outside of government and researchers. So, um, just to touch on a few, you can use them to model flood risk and project sea level rise. Um, but you can also identify vulnerable areas and vulnerable infrastructure. Um, and you can communicate these threats and monitor changes over time. Um, and you can also use, you can use all of this information to inform management decisions. And to be a bit more specific, these maps are uh, particularly useful for coastal restoration projects. They're already being used in quite a few in Nova Scotia. So, for example, in the Bay of Fundy, um, drones are being used to um, map dikes and salt marshes uh, to inform management practices. So, I, I, have, I thought it was clear that these maps are a great tool um, to help with coastal climate change adaptation. Compared to a plane or a helicopter, they're cost effective. They provide improved data and they can easily replicate flights. The drones store the data and they store the flight plan. So you can go back and um, undertake the same flight with relative ease, which is pretty beneficial for long-term projects, long-term monitoring projects. Um, I guess it's worth noting that there are some limitations with this technology. They have a short flight time, um, which means that the area that the maps cover is reduced to so the they're much more suitable to site-specific applications. So yeah, for example, like a wharf or like one small beach area. Um, and they're fair weather flyers, so not that many of the drones can be flown um, in the rain or in strong wind conditions. And you have to be um, aware of Transport Canada regulations when you're flying drones. So because these, this technology is still sort of pretty new and it's not, used that widely, there aren't that many clear methodologies and these really need to be developed in order to make the technology more accessible and to ensure that there's safe and accurate data collection that can be replicated and so these maps can be used for a variety of different applications. Um, yeah, and I guess, so I guess I would just say just to summarize that these applications are only going to grow as the technology improves. Um, and the realistic visualizations that they provide allow the viewer to connect and engage with the maps. So this goes beyond just data collection and modeling, and they can be used to inform management and, um, and help with engagement. So it's so this through, do this through improving spatial information and um, fostering dialogue. Um, and yeah, and as you saw with like various maps, that's super important when you're communicating climate change and talking about like the steps moving forwards. And yeah, drones have been used for several of the applications that I listed in the previous table in Nova Scotia, but I'm um, very excited to see um, them being become more widely available in the future. Yeah, I think that's everything. Thank you. Thank you, Rianne, that was great. Um, really nice to see uh, some of those favorite places uh, from the air. and. Uh, <laughs> Very interested to see the use of that tool. I'm going to pass it over to Steve for uh, questions. Thanks, Rian. That was very interesting, actually. Could you can you um, so you you noted the limitation in flight length? Uh -huh. 
as a limitation, but can you um, use as a as a software function, could you combine sequential flight data to enlarge the potential target area? I guess is the question. Yeah, I think that would be possible as long as you would like you use a consistent methodology um, and you use like the similar ground control points. Um, yeah, I think that's possible. Because I mean, really, it's it's a battery change, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's a battery change. Yeah, cool. <laughs> so that's what I was thinking. You, all, it, as long as you've got a hockey sock full of batteries, <laughs> you essentially have a fairly large potential mm -hmm. area, but you need to be able to find some way to combine it in software. Yeah, definitely. Just a, a lot of backup batteries in your yeah. Um, What kind of drone do you have? What model name? Yeah, so the one that we used for, for these maps was the Insp DJI Inspired 2. Um, yeah, and it was it's a, it was a pretty user user friendly drone, and actually we we pre programmed the flight plan. So when we went out and flew the drone, you you just have to press go, and it and it does the whole thing itself, which is which is really cool. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, there are no other questions in here to oh. that. Rihanna. Are you still on, Barry? Yes, I, I would like to ask a question if I may. Well, actually, and here's a question for you too that I missed in the earlier okay. chat. Okay. Somebody want to know if you provide training services for LIDAR interpretation, specifically for forest inventory. Uh, no, that's outside of our expertise. I mean, we're only learning that actually. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's, it's, it's fairly specialized. Now, uh, now but, you can go ahead and ask your question if you like. Oh, okay, absolutely. So, uh, Rian, um, the the information you take is is the resolution of the images there is really spectacular, and and of course, as you know, we ours is from a plane and much higher up. Now, uh, we have never done this, but we have worked with with drone three uh, D uh, photogrammetry. Is this what this is, or is it lidar also? Yes, it's 3D photogrammetry. Right, right. It, now, there is some limitations with the resolution of, of that uh, for the accuracy, but can you see uh, that stitched into our program, for example, if you wanted to go and look at a particular dock, you could zoom into that dock and then access the extra detail, right? Because yeah. Because that's how we saw doing it. There was a couple of people saying, well, we want the whole area, but we can't have that type of resolution, but we're really concerned about this delta mouth. You give us the information, we drop it in, and then, then it's accessible through, like I'll say, you know, like a, a menu or portal, right? Yeah, I think that's a really great application for this type of mapping. Yeah. Yeah. So do you know, I heard you mention the accuracy. Is that is the elevation accuracy consistent? It, like is that something that could be used to, to really model or is it is it just an indication like how how comfortable you are you with that to tell someone's house is going to flood yeah i don't know if um i quite have all the knowledge here to fully answer that question the mapping that we did because it was the first time using this methodology it, our, our yeah. maps aren't as accurate as they could be we didn't use ground control points and okay. there's some other people in the province that have got sort of better, more accurate methodologies um, you might be able to answer that. But I think that definitely if it's used correctly, it could be used to, to sort of, yeah, coastal properties or any properties that are at risk of flooding. It could be really, it would be a great use to sort of like see the, the threats that they're facing. Well, that's great. I really appreciate that because I can see where someone's going to come and say, I've had somebody fl fly this. I'd like this put into our model. So that's something I re really like to do because that way you can, you know, get the micro and the macro all, all, all there. Thank you. There's a couple of other questions coming up here, Rianne. What software do you use? And we use the Agisoft Metashape okay. software. And, and the other one, it's a more a comment, I guess, from Lee saying that sharing the pilot methodology to regional EN, ENGOs could be helpful as people, so people can sort of adopt and learn together. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And and actually, I think there's, I've been, there's a few other groups, I think, um, I don't know if Jeremy is, is, is on this call still, that have been doing the drone mapping in the Bay of Fundy, and they have um, a very, like, sort of, like, clear and precise methodology. Okay. So, um Look, I'd be, it'd be interesting to sort of like take that and make it a bit more sort of easy accessible to other NGOs and groups. Oh, yeah, because it's certainly becoming an affordable approach. You know, it's. Uh... Yeah, definitely. Okay, thanks, Ryan. I think that's it. Yeah, Might thank be you. Questions, Leif? Great. 
thanks to Barry and Rianne, uh, and thanks again, Steve, for moderating the questions and for everybody who took part in uh, in this part of uh, in this part of the conference.